Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Dick Powell and Linda Darnell in Christmas in July with Raymond Walburn. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you're wondering what's happened to my young friend, Cecil B. DeMille, well, don't worry. He'll be back next week. This week, he's in Chicago for an opening of the story of Dr. Wassell, and he's trusted me with the keys to the Lux Radio Theater. I happen to have a week off at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, where they're celebrating 20 years of making pictures by presenting a fine new production called The White Cliffs of Dover. Before C.B. left, he'd arranged for a play and a cast, which I'm sure you're going to like, and which has been a pleasure for me to work with. It's the paramount hit, Christmas in July, and the stars are two favorites of yours and mine, Dick Powell and Linda Darnell. Naturally, boy meets girl in this story, but from there on, Mr. Preston Sturgis, who wrote and directed the picture, has a brand new idea which will give you a few surprises before the hour is over. If C.B. were here tonight, I guess he'd say something about Lux Flakes at this point. Well, now, I don't know much about laundry, but I do know that a theater like this is a wonderful thing for about 30 million people. To an old trooper like me, the idea of an audience enjoying these plays without buying a ticket is fantastic. But here it is. You don't have to buy a thing. Of course, the sponsor of this theater won't be exactly angry if you go out and try some Lux Flakes. But and after you try it, then we want you to decide the whole matter on its merits. You see, we know just how it's going to come out. <laughs> and now, let's go back a few years to a time when hearts were young and gay, and a certain boy and girl discovered Christmas in July. Here's the curtain for the first act, starring Dick Powell as Jimmy and Linda Darnell as Betty, with Raymond Walburn as Maxford. Five months ago, the Maxwell House Coffee Company offered a $25,000 first prize for the best Maxwell House coffee slogan. And in three minutes, over the Maxwell House Coast to Coast radio program, the winner's name is scheduled to be announced. But something that even Dr. Maxwell himself could not foresee has happened. After plowing through a million entries, the bleary-eyed and weary juries hopelessly deadlocked, and now into their hushed and solemn precincts, Dr. Maxford descends with all the graciousness of a blockbuster. I don't care what you think about it. I'm not going to... Quiet! Finish. That's what I'm not going Quiet! to... Quiet! What's all this hogwash about a deadlock? Where's the verdict? Well, we can't oh, answer, it. answer my question, you idiots! Don't ask us. Ask Bill Docker. He's been holding out all day. I'll hold out forever. A bunch of fat-headed, mealy-mouthed, lame brains. Oh, Why, I oh, wouldn't oh, agree oh, to oh, a oh, thing oh, like that. Quiet! Have... Quiet! Don't you know that our program is on the air? Don't you know that the whole of America is waiting for your verdict? That you're giving heart failure to the Western Hemisphere? What do you know about picking slogans anyway? Why, you wouldn't know a slogan if you slipped on one. If you gentlemen had the combined brains of a glow worm... But we're all agreed, Doctor. That is all except the brilliant Mr. Bill Docker. Well, let me tell you something, Mr. Bill Docker. I'm giving you just four seconds flat to get in line. Oh, no, you're not. I'm a member of this jury, and I'm going to vote the way I think is right if it takes ten years. I'm giving my services free to a bunch of suckers who fell for a lot of dribble that don't amount... Hello? Oh, we are, are we? Well, that's just lovely. The Maxwell House program is signing off the air, gentlemen, so just take your time. You can stay here till next Wednesday for all I care, or you can stay here till Hoboken freezes over. You have failed in our promise to the public. We have muffed the most dramatic advertising moment in the annals of commerce, and you made a fat head out of me. The next nitwit who takes talks to me about a contest had better duck before I swing on him. And in conclusion, gentlemen, and especially you, Mr. Bill Docker, let me say that I have seen far, far better heads on a glass of beer. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we bring to a close 
the 449th Maxford House program. I wish I could have given you the winner's name, but I'm afraid it'll have to wait until next Wednesday. But after all, like the prisoner said when the hangman couldn't find the rope, no nooses, good news. <laughs> uh, turn Hoffman, it off, Betty. You all oh, may as night. well. How do you like that? To build you up to a big finish and then leave you hanging on a meat hook. Come on, I'll walk down with you. Oh, let's stay here and talk, Jimmy. It's so hot. That's a great way to spend an evening. Sitting on the roof of a broken-down apartment house because I don't have the dough to do anything else. Oh, now, that's not so. It's cool up here. Besides, you wouldn't have missed listening to Maxford House for anything. A lot of good it did me. I wish they'd get that contest over one way or another. You start thinking about that $25,000. Or even the second prize at $10,000. Or even anything. You said it. And then when you've practically got it right in your mitts, they'll leave you there with your tongue hanging out. Did you really think you were going to win it, Jimmy? I haven't lost it yet, have I? Well, how many contests have you lost? Well, never mind. Well, every time I've lost one, I've doubled my chances on the next. It's what you call the law of averages. Like when I lost on how many peanuts are there in this window. Well, that doubled my chances on the you fill in the missing words contest. But you lost that one, too. So I was eight to one when I went into the limerick contest. But you didn't win it, Jimmy. Well, that's what makes it such a sense this time. Can't you just see it over there on Broadway? A great big electric sign... A guy swallows his coffee and it says, if you don't sleep at night, it isn't the coffee, it's the bunk. You gotta admit, that's some slogan. Uh-huh. Well, do you get the point? Do you understand what it means? Yes. Well, it's as clear as crystal. It isn't the coffee, it's the bunk. If you don't sleep at night, it isn't the coffee that keeps you awake, it's the bunk. I know what it says. I, I just don't understand it. Well, a kid or two could understand it. That Viennese doctor in the Sunday paper, he said that old idea is just a superstition. Instead of keeping you awake, coffee makes you sleep. Now, that's simple enough, isn't it? Coffee makes you sleep. It doesn't make me sleep. Well, he says it makes you sleep. He's a Viennese doctor. Jimmy, coffee keeps you awake. That's a well-known fact. Why are you so pig-headed I about it? I tell you, it's a new scientific theory. People only think coffee keeps them awake. Those kind of people are nervous wrecks and couldn't sleep anyway. So I say, if you don't sleep at night, it isn't the coffee, it's the bunk. Do you get it? I guess so. You guess so? What does it mean? It's the bunk. Yes. But do you get the play on words? Oh, Jimmy, you don't need a play on words. Anytime anybody tells you that coffee makes you sleep, you don't need a play on words to know it's the bunk. Don't you understand? Don't you understand? It's funny. It means if you don't sleep at night, it isn't the coffee that keeps you awake. It's the bunk. <laughs> the bed. The bed. With me, it's the coffee. Oh. Oh, Jimmy, you know I want you to win. I'm just as anxious as you are. And, gee, when you lose this one, just think how much better your chances are on the next one. Uh, fine chance anybody's got to win again anything if everybody going around saying coffee keeps you awake. All right, all right. Let's go downstairs and drink a gallon of coffee and see which one sleeps the longest. Oh, shut up. Jimmy! Yes, Mom? Mr. Zimmerman says, will you please not talk so loud? He's starting to go to sleep. Oh, tell him to drink a cup of coffee. <laughs> and don't take hold up there. All right, Mom. <sighs> oh, Jimmy... Jimmy, you know, I'd like it just as much if you didn't win the old contest. Ah, uh, that's because you're a sap. I am not a sap. Nix. Two can live cheaply as one, you know. Who wants to live cheaply? <laughs> Jimmy, what would you do if you won the $25,000? Stick in the bank. Wouldn't you even buy a little ring or something? Oh, what's the use of talking about it, honey? You know I'd spend it all on you and Mom. I'd get you a big, shiny car and a swell apartment. Anything you wanted. Uh, we'd be happy, all right. Oh, we could be happy anyway. When you say that, you just make me mad. Now, look at my own mother. She's never been to the country for more than one day, never had any nice furniture. The dream of her life is a Davenport that turns into a double bed at night with a crank. <laughs> she's never had a decent dress except what she's made herself, and my old man, hmm, worn out at 48 and died because he couldn't afford a decent doctor. So I earn $26 a week and you want to get married. And I earn 18 and that makes 44. Sure, sure. And you've got your ma and I've got mine and then we have a baby and you have to stop work and we're right back at the same old 26 again. <laughs> Except then there's you and the kid and the two old ladies. Oh, but Jimmy, don't... Nix, I... honey, Nix. They didn't give you wrists like that and hands like that to spoil them scrubbing floors for a dope like me. A man's got to look out for himself in this whole world and a girl's got to do the same instead of fooling away her time on a guy like me. Unless he crashes through. Oh, you make me tired. Then go to bed. Well, that's a nice thing to say. You invite a girl over to your roof and, and then yell at her. Listen, if I wanted to be insulted, I could have gone out with a credit manager. Who's stopping you? Well, thank you very much. 
It's very nice to know just where I stand. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Well, maybe I will go out with the credit manager. Good night. Now, uh, wait a minute. I'll help you with that skylight. Kindly let go of my arm and mind your own business. Oh, shut up. Why don't you shut up? Why don't you both shut up? <laughs> Wise guy. Now, don't fall down the ladder. I've been down the ladder before. You fell down it before, too. Good night. Yeah. See you at the office. Aren't you going to take me? Hmm? Well, okay. Good night, Jimmy. Good night, honey. Good night, darling. Good night, darling. Good night! Hey. Hey, Charlie. Yeah? I got to go out in the hall to phone. Tip me off if the boss comes in, will you? Yeah. Well, you got a phone. Oh, the Maxford House Coffee Company. Maybe they picked the winner of that slogan contest by now. Oh, go ahead, Jimmy. If I see Waterbury, I'll warn you. Thanks. I'll be right back. <laughs> hey, Al, get a load of that. I wonder what one of those suckers would do if they ever did win anything. Well, it's very easy to find out. Huh? All you need is a telegram blank, some scissors, and some glue. You type it out, cut it in strips, and glue it in the blank. Holy mackerel. You mean like a gag? We work this gag on Jimmy? Sure. We'll pick up a telegram blank at lunchtime, leave it on his desk. He'll think he won 25,000 bucks. Oh, brother, wait till you see his kisser when he reads it. We are happy to inform you that you have won the Maxford House Coffee Contest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, I was just wondering if the jury has reached a verdict yet on the contest. Oh, they haven't? Oh, in a minute, huh? Well, thanks a lot. Goodbye. Oh, I gotta win it. I gotta. <laughs> You, uh, sent for me, Mr. Waterbury? Close the door, MacDonald. You had a good lunch, MacDonald? About the same as always. Nothing I... wrong with your appetite. You feel well. Why, sure. I, I feel fine, Mr. Waterbury. I've been watching you for some time, MacDonald. Yes, sir. You used to make me kind of nervous. Not nervous anymore? Oh, no, sir. Look at this. Your morning worksheet. The comptometer you operate is almost foolproof, MacDonald. Yet you managed to miss your total by a little matter of $11,000. Mm. To what do you attribute this? I, uh, I, I don't know, Mr. Waterbury. Have you troubles at home, then? You play the races? Or are you simply incapable of doing your work? Well, I... Oh, I, I guess it's the contest, Mr. Waterbury. The Maxford House contest. It's been on my mind. I had no idea it was hurting my work. Oh, and how much is the prize? The first prize, $25,000. Ah, yes. I used to think about $25,000. And then one day I realized I would never have $25,000. And then suddenly another day, considerably later on in life, I realized something else. I may not be a rich man, but I'm not a failure either. Ambition is all right if it works, but no system could be right where only half of 1% were successes and all the rest were failures. No, I'm not a failure. I'm a success. And so are you. If you earn your own living and pay your own bills and look the world in the eye, I hope you win your $25,000, Mr. MacDonald. But if you shouldn't happen to, don't worry about it. Now get the heck back to your desk and try to improve your arithmetic. Yes, sir, Mr. Waterbury. Gosh, thanks a lot. That's all right. Hey, hey, what's this? What's what? Well, this, this telegram. You got me. Kid just brought it in. What's it say? Huh? Wow! Wow! Betty! Betty, Betty, come here. Everybody come here. Honey, honey, quick, everybody, come here, this telegram. Wow! Boys and girls, there comes a time in everybody's life when you just got to climb up on your desk and let her rip. Yippee! <laughs> Hold on, everybody. I've just won the $25,000 Maxford House contest. Oh, Jimmy! Jimmy! MacDonald, that's wonderful. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Look, do you think I could use the company phone for just one call? Help yourself. Thanks, thanks. Hello? Hello? Oh, Astoria 55970. Oh, this is really going to be good. <laughs> That's where he lives. Hello. Hey, uh, oh, Mr. Schwartz, I hate to bother you, but could I talk to my mother a minute? Yes, it's very important. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. I'll let you use my phone all you like when I get one. That's the neighbor she's calling my mother. <laughs> hey, shh, shh, quiet now, quiet, quiet. Shh, quiet, everybody. Huh? Hello, Mom. Mom, now don't get scared. No, of course I'm not hurt. Mom, listen, listen. Are you a rich woman or a poor woman? No, I'm not crazy with the heat, Mom. Look. Mom, you can go out and buy yourself anything you want. New furniture, automobiles, new dresses. Oh, the electric washer. Yeah, yeah, the electric washer. You know the one you like, the green one? It's yours, Mom. Hey, Charlie. Yeah, this ain't so good. 
Yeah, and the Davenport, the one that turns into the double bed with the crank, it's yours, it's all yours, and anything else you want. Listen, guys, this is going to cost us one Davenport. I'll tell the world I got a raise. And how he got a raise. Look, we just got to put him out of his misery. Yeah, some gag. I didn't know he'd go nuts like this. Hey, look who's coming, Mr. Baxter. <laughs> yes, everything's wonderful, Ma. I'll, well, I'll call you back, honey. What's going on around here? What is this, football game? What are you doing up on that desk? Never mind what you're doing, you're fired. What's your name? James McDonald, sir, and this is my fiance, Miss Casey. I'll let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> well, what's so funny? What is it? Waterbury, where are you? I demand an explanation. Mr. Baxter, I really see no point in firing this If lad, anyone he... ought to be fired around here, it's me. Never mind the noble gestures. I'll decide what's what around here. Waterbury. Wait a minute. You don't understand what's happened, Mr. Baxter. These children are part of your family, your business family, and anything that happens to them happens to you. This young man you fired has just won the $25,000 Maxwell House slogan contest. And in my opinion, that's ample reason for this uh, demonstration. Well, I should say it is. Congratulations, young man. Thanks. Now I suppose I'll have to hire you back at a fat increase. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always liked it here, Mr. Baxter, but a little raise would come in handy. And you really won the Maxford contest, eh? Here's a telegram. And what was your slogan? Oh, if you don't sleep at night, it isn't the coffee... It's the bunk. Well, it's, uh, it's a play on words. It means if you don't But sleep coffee it... keeps you awake. I know. Yeah, but don't you see this, this Vinny Scientist? He it's says... It's a that... very clever slogan, just the same. It isn't the coffee, it's the bunk. Excellent for the entire industry. Uh, you didn't happen to get any ideas for Baxter and Son while you were inventing slogans for our competitors, did you? You know... We make coffee, too. I certainly did, Mr. Baxter. I've been trying to give ideas to the advertising department ever since first came here, but they won't listen to me. Well, how would you like to come into my office and tell me a few of these ideas? Yes, sir. I'll, I'll wait here for you, Jim. Oh, no, no, no. You come, too, my dear. My, my. 25,000 smackers. <laughs> You see, Mr. Baxter, Mr. Jenkins, Mr. Babcock, I, I tried to find a slogan for Baxter's Coffee, too. One that would imply that Baxter's was the finest coffee made. The aristocrat of coffees. Aristocrat? Babcock, revise your thinking. Aristocrat? Oh, no, no, that's been used too much. Oh. And uh, what is your slogan for Baxter's, Jimmy? Baxter's, the blue blood coffee. It's bread and the bean. Uh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Jenkins... What's your reaction to that? Hmm. I'm mulling it over, Chief. The blue blood coffee. It's bread in the bean. That's it. Bread in the bean. It's wonderful. It is? I mean, it is. I can see it all over the nation. Jimmy, you're a genius. Thank you. And, uh, and now that you're a capitalist, I don't know how you'd feel about working for a living. But if you'd care to have a little office here... Oh, you mean all to himself, with his name on the door? Naturally, and with you as his oh. secretary, and of course a reasonable increase in salary. I see no reason why we shouldn't shake hands on it now. Oh, Jimmy, quick, shake his hand. Sure, well, gee, gee, Mr. Baxter, thank you. That's swell, that's fine. I, I just don't know what to say. Well, I think you've said quite enough, my boy. Now, why don't you take the afternoon off while we get an office ready for you? I'd certainly appreciate it. Uh, do you suppose Betty could come along, too? Why, of course she can. And the little bird tells me just where you'll be headed for. Some little jewelry store, I'll wager, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you're not very far along, Mr. Baxter. But first of all, I think I'll go over to Maxford House and pick up that little check. Oh, yes, we'd almost forgotten about that, hadn't we? Oh, not me. I hadn't. Uh, uh, what was your slogan for Maxford again? It isn't the coffee, it's the bunk. Isn't that marvelous? It isn't the coffee, it's but, the... But, uh, but, uh, it's bread in the bean. That's the one for my money. Functional. Precisely. Well, I don't know how to thank you all. Well, goodbye. Uh, goodbye. Uh, goodbye. Thank you goodbye. again, Mr. Baxter. <laughs> oh, not at all. I had my eye on that boy for some time. A big future. Immense. Jimmy. Hey, hey, wait a second, Jimmy. Hi, Harry. What's on your mind? Need a few bucks? Oh, hello, buddy. Jimmy, uh... Could I talk to you for a second, alone? Uh, could you beg it tomorrow, Harry? Gosh, we got to go over and pick up that check. They, they might think we weren't grateful or something. But that's just what I want to talk to you about. You see, Charlie and Al and I, we... Oh, uh... Uh, McDonald. Yes, sir? Uh, was that it's bread in the bean or just bread in the bean? Oh, it's, Mr. Baxter. You see, just bread in the bean uh, might sound like bread in the bean. I'll fix that one. <laughs> might sound like bread and butter or something like that. 
Yes, naturally. I don't know why I didn't realize that. Is that all, sir? Of course. Uh, have a nice time and don't spend all your money. We won't. Well, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye. Ah, great mind. Oh, did you wish to speak to me, Petty Pass? Uh, who, me? Oh, no, sir. I just watching them go out. Well, well, it's been quite an exciting day, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. And it ain't hardly even begun yet. <laughs> Before we present Act Two of Christmas in July, starring Dick Powell and Linda Darnell, Libby and I want you to decide an argument that's been going on between us. Oh, not really an argument, Mr. Kennedy. It's a debate. Well, whatever you call it, the question Libby and I have been discussing is... Do women dress to please men or other women? I say to please you men. But just try asking a man to describe what a pretty girl is wearing. He can tell you the color of her hair, whether she has good-looking legs and nice hands... But uh, Maybe he can't describe her dress, but he'd know it all right if it were unbecoming. Well, to be honest, there's one thing a man does notice, and that's the color. Now, I saw a girl in a red dress the other day, and... Oh, you see? You've admitted my point. But seriously, it is important to wear becoming colors and to have everything you wear look color fresh and lovely. That's why I talk so much about Lux Care for Colors, Mr. Kennedy. Just a booby trap for us men, huh, Libby? <laughs> well, not entirely, Mr. Kennedy. It's pretty hard on the budget if colors fade or run in washing. But here are the facts. Washing tests have proved that gentle Lux Care keeps colors lovely up to three times longer. That's a big difference. Indeed it is. Gentle Lux flakes are safe for anything safe in plain water. You see, when you use harsh wash day methods like rough handling or rubbing, strong soaps and too hot water, well, delicate colors can't stand that kind of treatment. So whether you're dressing to please the man in your life or impress other women, or to pamper your own pocketbook, the moral is... Stick to gentle Lux flakes for colors. We both agree on that point, Mr. Kennedy. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act Two of Christmas in July, starring Dick Powell as Jimmy and Linda Darnell as Betty, with Raymond Walburn as Maxford. It's 45 minutes later, and blissfully unaware that they're victims of a practical joke, Jimmy and Betty are waiting in the reception room of the Maxford House Coffee Company. And the office of the president, Dr. Maxford, is percolating furiously to the announcer of his radio program. Contest! Con what good are contests anyway? Why, they make you a million enemies. And all, you, all they prove is that you've got too much money in the first place. Since you can't afford to toss a large chunk of it to some sap who probably never had a cup of your coffee in his life, but exists on goat's milk. Oh, it's deplorable, Doctor. Has the jury reached a verdict yet? I don't know, and I don't care. Uh, well, maybe if they could hold off until our next broadcast. Oh, no, no, that would be the intelligent thing to do. That would be useful to the company that feeds and clothes them and sends their children to college so that they can grow up to be dumbbells like their parents. Well, well, what, well, what do you want? The contest one is here, Dr. Maxford. All right, bring him in. Yes, sir. Well, how do you like that? Then they've reached a decision. How do I know? I'm only the president. Why should that jury of imbeciles bother to tell me anything? I'll have their heads for this. Why, I'll... I, uh, well, come in. Oh. Well, how do you do, sir? I suppose I have the honor of addressing Dr. Maxford, I presume? Yes, and this is Don Harper, our announcer. And this is my fiance, Miss Casey. Well, it's certainly a pleasure meeting you. How, how do you do? Congratulations. Thanks. Here's the telegram, Dr. Maxford. Yes? Yeah? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Great pleasure to inform you. Uh, $25,000. Kindly call and pick up your check. And... Oh, you, are my, uh, you aren't by any chance a coffee drinker, are you? Yes, sir. I certainly am. Well, well that's surprising. <laughs> you don't by any chance drink my coffee, do you? Well, no, sir. Uh, you see, we're both employed over at... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, that sounds more natural. Yeah. But we could easily change. Sure. Uh, I think it would only be fair. Oh, don't bother, Mr. McDonald. I wouldn't want anybody to think that I had any base commercial motives in this, all this. Uh, I just... Uh, I just give my money away because I can't sleep at night. I have a guilty conscience. But that's my slogan. That's the one I won with. 
Oh, well, I guess you know all about that. A guilty conscience, eh? I can see that my money is well spent. That is a wonderful slogan. Oh, no, sir. Uh, the slogan is, if you can't sleep at night, it isn't the coffee, it's the bunk. I beg your pardon? It's a... <laughs> it's a pun. It certainly is. Why, I, I can hardly wait to give you my money. Miss Slidewell! Yes, sir. Bring me that contest check. I don't know whether you've ever had anything like this happen to you, Doctor. But to be poor and unknown one minute and sitting on top of the world the next minute, that's a feeling nobody can ever take away from me. Oh, but it's more than that. It's the knowledge that Jimmy won this contest because he thought up a better slogan than anyone else. You see, I used to think I had good ideas and that I'd get somewhere in the world, but, well, now I know it. And that's what I want to thank you for, Dr. Maxford, even more than the money. Here's the check, Dr. Maxford. Uh, how do you spell your name, young man? Is it M-C or M-A-C? M-A-C, sir. James MacDonald. You know, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's customary under these circumstances to have a few photographers present or even a microphone or reporter. But since we do everything here on a highly non-commercial basis, I merely take pleasure in giving you this small check written out with my heart's blood, and that's all there is to it here. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maxford. I... I don't know how I could ever find words to... Never mind them. Just uh, goodbye and good luck. Oh, Jimmy, just look at it. Just look. Oh, boy. Now, Miss Slidewell, get me Bill Docker. I tried to, sir. When I got the check, he isn't in his office. Well, where is he? Down in the lobby of the yo-yo? <laughs> you find him and tell him... Oh, never mind. I'll find him myself. When I... It isn't the coffee, it's the bunk. Jumping Jerusalem! <laughs> You know what? We could get everything here, the ring and everything, all in this one store. Uh -huh. Can I help you? Oh, that, that diamond ring there in the showcase. Oh, it's so beautiful, Jimmy. Holy smoke, I should say so. But here's a ring of more practical dimensions. Fiery little devil, isn't it? Does a magnifying glass come with it? I was only trying to be helpful, that's all. Mm. It's immaterial to me how big a stone you'll look at. Ah, uh, fresh guy. Yeah, what do you think of this, for instance? Boy, how much is that one? $12,000. We oh. wouldn't care to spend that much. No, that's what I thought. But I could have I felt like it. Oh, you could? Well, that puts everything on an entirely different basis. Now, let oh, me see. Oh, Jimmy, uh... I'm in love with that one. There in the case, see Ah, it? yes. Well, there's no denying it's a lovely little rock. Well, then I guess we'll take it. Yes, sir. Of course, I haven't got the cash with me, uh -huh. but I... Uh -huh. I got a check here. And, uh, may I see the check? Sure. Oh, he just won the Maxford House contest. See, isn't it wonderful? Well, I'll be... Mr. Schmidt! Mr. Schmidt! Oh, for heaven's sake, congratulations. I might say 25,000 congratulations. <laughs> <Yes>. Mr. Schmidt, <laughs> kindly cut a groove, will you? Now, if you'll watch closely, I merely remove the two cushions, press the button marked night, and with one easy push of the finger, it changes into a double bed. Comes morning, a turn of the crank, and presto. It assumes the characteristics of the finest Davenport money can buy. It's called the Davenola, Mr. McDonald. Price? One ninety-eight fifty uh, plus tax. We'll take it. What a bargain you're getting! <laughs> I beg your pardon. Oh, uh, this is Mr. Schindel, the owner of the establishment. Congratulations, and the check is good. I just phoned the Maxford Company. Mm. Well, how soon do you think you could send the Davenola? Mrs. McDonald's been waiting for years. It's there already. Make it a special, Hillbanger. Do you suppose your mother would like one? Oh, oh no, thank you, Jimmy. We haven't got room. Well, we got to get us something. We got to get everybody something. Well, say, Mom's been wanting a new iron for a long time. She's got it. Compliments of shindles. Free, she's got it. <laughs> Betty, we got... We got to get something for Mrs. Schwartz and a doll for Sophie. Oh, and yeah. Then there's old Mr. Zimmerman and the Casey kids. Oh, and... but, Jimmy, we've spent so much, honey. I mean, the ring and the silver fox jacket and... Nonsense. The, the Finnegan kids and Pantrobe and Goldstein. Well, Tony Marzeppo. And Mr. Romanoff. Look, you just better work up one side of the street and down the other. Wonderful. Okay, Mr. Schindel, where's the toy department? <laughs> Well, there are the trucks, Mr. McDonald, all loaded. They'll shoot right uptown with everything. Gosh, thanks. And for you and Miss Casey, a taxi cab. Also compliments of Schindel. He'll buy it. Put in the other package. Yes, sir. Oh, how can we ever thank you? And that's not all. From Schindel's fernery, a beautiful orchid for the lady. <gasps> oh, Jimmy, look. An orchid? Oh, oh look, Mr. Schindel, I, I don't like buying all those things without paying for them. Nonsense, Mr. McDonald. 
We know an honest man when we see one, don't we, boy? Well, yes, well, well, Mr. Shandell, why don't you take the check and, and give me the change? Uh, we should have change for such a check. Well, I'll, I'll bring you the money as soon as I put the check in the bank. Well, who's in a hurry? Drop in any time. Drop in tomorrow. <laughs> I certainly will, sir. Well, goodbye. Well, the taxi's all ready. Thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, uh, come in and see us again. We will. Goodbye and thanks again. Goodbye. Ah, what a boy. What a business. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy, Jimmy. No, I feel kind of good myself. Can you see the faces on everybody when we get there? Yeah, like, like Christmas in July. Well, Happy New Year. Oh, it will be a Happy New Year, too, darling, from now on. Everything new and clean and different. And just think, Jimmy, no more worry. No more worry. That's the only terrible thing about being poor. Say, what kind of a house are we going to have? Any kind you like. How about a penthouse? <laughs> they come kind of high, don't they? Oh, I was... <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, Jimmy, you fool. <laughs> will you love me always? Of course I will. For always and always? I don't know why not. Might be a long time. <laughs> Might be uh, an awful long time. I hope so. The longer, the sweeter, baby. Hmm, gosh. Oh, gosh. I just don't know what to think, Mr. Zimmerman. Buy anything you want, he says. An automobile, new dresses, furniture, even a Davenport. Anything. I know. My Ivan, he drinks too once in a while. <laughs> oh, but Jimmy, he never takes a drink unless something terrible has happened. Mentally he lost his job. But he said he got a raise. A raise? Who gives raises these days? Listen, that noise in the street. What is it? Maybe a funeral. Look, right in front of the house. Such a congregation. Look, there's Betty. She's bringing him home and a taxi cab. Well, don't you worry, Mrs. McDonald. Maybe just a little accident. A leg, maybe, or a finger. Oh, oh. Mom. Hey, Mom. There he is. Come on down. You too, Mr. Zimmerman. He's got presents for everybody. Get Mrs. Schwartz. Jimmy boy, Jimmy. Drunk as a lord in the middle of the afternoon. I never thought I'd live to see it. Never. Hey, now take it easy. There's something here for everybody. And what isn't here soon will be three truckloads. Wait a second. Oh, here's her doll, Sophie. Hey, where's Sophie? Jimmy! Here, darling, in this box. Hey, somebody find my mother. And, and look at this, everybody. Look, it's two carrots, too. Oh, Jimmy! Mom. Jimmy! Mom. Jimmy! Oh, what's happened? Are you drunk? Are you hurt? Mom. Jimmy, what's going on? Mom, but, Mom. But, now, now, look at me, Mom. I'm fine. And everything I told you is true. The Davenport's on the way here and a lot of other stuff. Special trucks. Oh, wait till you see, Mom. Oh, th then you did get a raise, old glory. Mom, Mom, sit down. Sit down on the curb. It doesn't matter. I'll get you a dozen new dresses. Yes. Look, Mom, here's a check. $25,000. Jimmy, oh, oh. Hold on to it, and I'll be right back. Hey, somebody find the ice cream wagon. Free ice cream, kids. Free ice cream for everybody. <laughs> Oh, now look, Bill Docker, get wise to yourself. If the slogan's good enough for the 11 of us, who are you to say that it smells? You smell. One more crack out of you, Arm Bruce, and I'll bust you right on the nose. Uh, Sit down. Both of you. Now look, Bill Docker, the public was promised they'd hear us announce the slogan winner last night on the radio. So we couldn't agree and we didn't announce it. We got to announce it by next Wednesday, and I think it's high time we talk this over. In a nice, friendly way, of course. I talk know. what over? Everybody but you says that this slogan is just what the doctor ordered. Maxford's magnificent and mellow. It's brief, it's smooth, it's pungent. It's putrid. And just why is it putrid, Mr. Bill Docker? Because it smells. Well, well, so there you are, Bill Docker, and all the rest of you playing poker, I suppose. Now, now that the contest is over, I wonder if you would be kind enough to go get back to your offices and try and sell a little coffee for a change, or am I becoming too commercial? And while I'm on the subject, I just want to tell you that of all the groups of fatheads that I've ever had the misfortune to gaze upon, you take the lard pail. And what about the contest? Well, what about it? Now that you've killed it, what do you want to do? Hold a postmortem on it? Don't you want us to choose a winner? You did choose a winner. Who chose a winner? We certainly did not choose a winner. Well, you certainly did choose a winner. You, if ever... What do you mean you didn't choose a winner? I mean we haven't reached a verdict yet. Well, you certainly have reached a verdict yet. And uh, what are you trying to do? Stand there and tell me you haven't reached a verdict yet? We have not. Then... 
Then why did you send him a telegram telling me he'd won? Answer me that. Send who a telegram? Mc, 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 McTavish. We didn't send any tel... You didn't... Who's McTavish? You didn't send any... Well, you certainly did send a telegram. <coughs> Jumping Jerusalem! Get my lawyer! Which one? Schlummel, Schlimmel, Abercrombie, and Schlitz! Oh, no, no, get no, the no, police! No, yes, no, you sir. can't do that. Quiet! No, you Quiet! Can't. And get me Schindler Brothers. The important thing in a moment like this is to remain cool and collected. Collected! Holy Moses, call the bank. What's the matter with everybody? Call my bank! <laughs> Oh, look at them, Jimmy. It's so wonderful I could cry. It's the best time they've ever had in all their lives. The whole darn neighborhood. Look See what at money them. can do, honey? Things hey, like this. Uh, well, get another load. It's all on me. <laughs> you didn't forget anyone, Jimmy. A present for everybody. Everybody but yourself. Well, what I want a present for, I've got you. Thank you, darling. Look, here comes the truck with Mom's staff for it. Oh, she'll love it, Jimmy. She's... Say, Jimmy, isn't that Mr. Schindel getting out of the truck? Oh, but he didn't have to come down here himself. Come on, baby, let's find Mom. Take it all away, boys. Everything you see. A bunch of thieves and robbers. Hey, what's the big idea of grabbing my scooter? It happens to be my scooter. What do you mean? Jimmy McDonald gave it to me. And when I get through with that low-life McDonald... Yeah, yeah, I'll... what's going on around here? Yeah, arrest them, officer. All these people, arrest them. Who do you think you are, Hitler? Yeah. <laughs> I tell you all this merchandise. It's the property of Schindel Brothers. And who's got it now? You got eyes. These loafers. Enjoying themselves with some of my best numbers. You, young lady, come back with that dolly buggy. Goldie, I don't have to. Do I? <laughs> now, beat it, kid, beat it. Have a good time. I tell you, everything is stolen, down to the last pogo stick. Stolen? What's stolen? Grab him, officer, that low life. He comes to my store with a phony check, and when I ask phony him Phony check? Low life. He ain't even had the decency to run away. Hey, now listen, you. Officer, arrest that man. Arrest him? You starting that again. Now calm down and tell me what he's supposed to have done. I've been telling you. He's supposed to walk into my store and flash a sour check in my face. He's supposed to walk out with a diamond ring, which I suppose I don't see on that young woman's finger, I suppose. <laughs> and a nice fur coat, which I suppose she ain't showing off in spite of the weather. Mm. Was Jimmy in his store, Betty? Well, sure he was. So was I. Jimmy offered him the check, but he didn't want to... Rubber take... checks he offers me yet. Who says it's a rubber check? Are you nuts? Dr. Maxford, the Maxford house. Maybe he's nuts. Listen, Dr. Maxford gave Jimmy that check himself. I saw him. If Jimmy says somebody gave him a check, then somebody gave him a check. Now, Mom, well, Mom, take it easy. It's well, just a little mistake somewhere. Well, okay, I... okay, Shindle. Now, go on home. Think it over. Uh, listen, you, I'll, I'll break you in so many pieces. You... <laughs> All of you, you're all witnesses. This officer refuses to arrest you. you. Are you trying to intimidate an officer in the pursuit of his duty? Yeah, who's trying to imitate anybody? <laughs> I only want... The, I want my... Officer, officer, arrest that man! They, that's been tried before. <laughs> Dr. Maxford, have you... Have you the nerve to even speak to me, young man? What are you talking about? I just want you to tell these people that you gave me a check. What check? What check? Why, why the one you gave him in your office. Let me see it. Certainly, here. Oh, that check. Well, now I feel better. Wait a minute. A crook? Destroying evidence? Who are you, you burglar? Schindle, you schnook. <laughs> I want all these people thrown in jail. Listen, Mussolini, Dr. I'm not Maxford, gonna... Dr. Maxford, if there's been something wrong, why don't you... Why did you give me the check? Why did you send me the telegram? I never sent you a telegram in my life. I never heard of you. Well, you're not going to say you didn't give me the check. That was entirely a mistake. I suspected you the minute you walked my office. You mean I didn't win? You know perfectly well you didn't win. Oh, Jimmy. But, Jimmy. but, gee, I... I uh, well... Wait a minute. He's entirely responsible. This Maxford. This is an honest boy, ladies and gentlemen. And this numbskull here gives him a check. I should take back the merchandise I sold in good faith? Drive it. Take the Davenport up to the ladies' apartment. Enjoy it in good health, my friend. A present from Dr. Maxwell. I'll see you in Hoboken before I pay for anything. And I'll see you in court, where I guarantee you will pay for everything. <laughs> well, I pass the ice cream cones around with love from Dr. Maxwell. He's paying for everything. Including court costs. Well, there's there's one present I have for you. 
Here! Yeah, oh, obviously. Oh, I'm assaulted with a bloody nose yet. <laughs> okay, okay, the two of you. I'll teach you to make trouble on my beat. You're going for a ride, both of you. Come on. Jimmy, where have you been, darling? Oh, just walking. Everybody's gone now. I've been sitting here on the steps waiting for you. I couldn't face him, Betty. Look, supper's ready, Jimmy. Been ready for an hour. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't matter, honey. You can't lose something you never had. I don't want his old ring or his old skunk. You know, what I can't figure out is who sent that telegram. Jimmy. Hmm? Is, isn't that Harry coming down the street? And Charlie? Yeah, they're carrying something. Well, it looks like... It's... It's a Davenport. Well, there's Al, too. Hiya, Jimmy. Betty. Well, what in the world are you all doing? We, uh, we got something for you, Jimmy. It's a kind of Davenport. Uh, is this the kind your ma wanted? Uh, the crank fits on here, and when you turn it, it, it makes it to a full-size double bed at night. The, the guy says it works swell. Oh, I don't know what you had to go get that for. Well, we, we kind of hoped to make up for that phony telegram we rigged up. It was supposed to be a gag, Jimmy. Just a gag. It wasn't a very funny joke. We're sorry, Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy... Oh, I, I see. I, I, I get it. Well, thanks for the Davenport. You can bring it upstairs if you want it. Oh, gee, thanks, Jimmy. We was awful worried. We figured maybe you'd be sore or something. No, I'm, I'm not sore. If you're going up now, tell my ma I won't be home for supper. Sure, we'll tell her, Jimmy. Okay, guys, let's lug her up. All right. Jimmy, where are you going? I don't know. May I uh, go with you? Mm -hmm. No, if you want to. It, it doesn't matter. I guess nothing matters anymore. Before Dick Powell and Linda Darnell return for Act Three of Christmas in July, Libby wants you to listen to something. See if you can tell the difference between these two sounds. Yes, one's short and one's long, but that's not all. Listen again carefully. That's right, the second one lasted three times longer than the first. Now that's exactly what can happen with your undies. If you wash them the wrong way, they soon look old and drab. But if you use Lux Flakes, they can stay lovely three times as long. Quite a difference, isn't there? But it's true. Actual washing tests proved it. We purposely washed pretty slips and nighties the wrong way. You know, with strong soap and too hot water. You should have seen them after 30 washings of that kind. Half their color was gone, and some of the straps and seams were frayed and pulled apart. But then we washed the same kind of undies in gentle, lukewarm Lux Suds, and they came out beautifully, still colorful and lovely and new-looking. Now, I know you don't want to ruin perfectly good undies proving to yourself what wrong washing can do, so take it from me. Don't risk your undies in soaps that are strong. Lux keeps them new-looking three times as long. Now, our producer, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. After the play, we'll have a chat with our stars. But now the curtain rises on the third act of Christmas in July, starring Dick Powell and Linda Darnell with Raymond Walburn. A few hours ago, Jimmy McDonald had $25,000 in cash and a couple of million in self-confidence. Right now, his physical assets total about 95 cents, and spiritually, well, there's more starch in your laundry bag. Jimmy's wandered all the way downtown. Force of habits brought him now to his office building. Betty's still at his side, and she says nothing when he takes the elevator to the floor marked Baxter and Son. Who that? Oh, that you, Mr. Jimmy? Hello, Sam. Uh, careful, sir, you don't slip on the floor. I've just been mopping up. Oh, evening, Miss Casey. Hello, Sam. Funny how different an office seems at night. <laughs> well, I always say how funny this office looks in the daylight. Forget to turn out the light in Dr. Baxter's office, oh, Sam? Oh, no, sir, no, sir. I don't forget. Mr. Baxter, he's still in there, conniving away on something or another. Oh. Well, you hoped he'd be here, didn't you, Jimmy? Oh, and in a way, I guess I hoped he wouldn't be. Oh. Why don't you wait and tell him in the morning? Sure glad to hear about your good luck, Mr. Jimmy. Uh, you wouldn't be needing a valley now, would you? No, thanks, Sam. Well, sir, I guess you're right. Pride ride before fall. 
But it sure ain't everybody that hits the jackpot while they's young and all. You said it. Oh, look, a kitten. Yeah. Hello, cat. Sam, is it good luck or bad luck when a black cat crosses your path? Well, miss, I always say that depends on what happens afterwards. <laughs> you said it, Sam. And it sure don't happen to everybody, sir. Oh, uh, your new office is ready for you, Mr. Jimmy. Yeah, so I see. You see the dough? The painter man just got through. You see what it says on the door? Let's look at it, Jimmy, huh? Yeah. Hmm. Mr. James McDonald. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, careful. I guess the paint's still wet. I, um, uh, I guess it wouldn't hurt if we went in and sat down for a minute. Oh, it was going to be nice, wasn't it? Oh. Oh, now Jimmy. stop it, honey. Come on, cut it out now. Oh, please, Betty. Wait a minute. May I come in? Oh. I heard you talking to Sam. Oh, uh, I was just coming in to see you, uh, Mr. Baxter. We stopped in to take a look at the office and... Well, I, uh, I hope you like it. Oh, it's, it's just lovely, Mr. Baxter. Yes, it isn't every young man who gets his own office and a private secretary at your age. The great many of them, I'm afraid it would go to their heads. But I think you have your feet uh, pretty solidly on the ground. Thank you, Mr. Baxter. Oh, I mean it sincerely. Mr. Jenkins and I discussed our little meeting at great length. And I want you to know that we were genuinely impressed. Genuinely so. Well, that's certainly nice to hear, uh, Mr. Baxter. I... Yes, the more we thought about your ideas, the more aware we became of their uh, pungency, their brevity, of their uh, sparkle. Thank you, sir. It's uh, certainly nice yes, to hear. Yes, you I... have a genuine talent for slogans. It must be like having an ear for music. Now, take me. I sing flat. And you, on the other hand, are a born sloganeer. It's bread in the bean. Hot ciggity. Well, it, uh, it's certainly wonderful to hear, uh, Mr. Baxter. I, I kind of got something on my mind, but, but you've certainly made me feel a lot better. I'll wager he has something on his mind, huh, Miss Casey? Oh, it's really not what you're probably thinking, Mr. Baxter. Oh? Well, it's, it's just this, sir. Uh, now, look. Uh, if my ideas were good this afternoon, then they're still good, aren't they? I mean, well, uh, they'd have to be. They're still the same ideas. Well, of course they are. Of course they are. I'm not quite sure that I receive your thought. Uh, well, I mean, if you thought the ideas were good this afternoon, you still think they're good, don't you? Well, of course I do. Why? Well, I, I, I mean, since they were good and, and they're still good, they'd have to be good. And then it wouldn't make so much difference if I... It did... wouldn't make any difference. Oh, any difference if I hadn't won the contest, the Maxford House contest, would it? Of course it would make a difference. Oh, it would? Well, certainly it would. Well, Why? Well, I'm no genius, but uh, I didn't hang on to my father's money by backing my own judgment, you know. I make mistakes every day, sometimes several times a day. I've got a whole warehouse full of mistakes. Well, I should say it would make a difference. You see, I think your ideas are good because they sound good to me. But I know your ideas are good because you won this contest over millions of others. Yes, but you see, Mr. Baxter, I... It's, uh, it's what you might call commercial insurance. It's like a racehorse. If a horse wins the Kentucky Derby, well, then, then you, you, you back him for the Preakness. But I didn't win it. The Preakness? The contest. I didn't win anything. It was a joke. A joke? That's what they meant it to be. Who did? Well, some of the fellows. Oh, th they didn't mean any harm. They, they just wanted to see how I'd look when I got the news, I guess. Well, just you give me their names and we'll see how they look when they get some news. Oh, I wouldn't care to do that, uh, uh, Mr. Baxter. I... Oh, well, it doesn't matter. What do you mean it doesn't matter? After I spend a whole afternoon listening to a lot of baloney entirely predicated upon the winning of this contest and, and, and giving you this office. Oh, but Mr. Baxter, how about it's bread and the bean, the blue blood coffee? Well, I don't know what about it. We'll find that out. There's plenty of time for that. But I won't be made a fool of, you understand. I can't go around handing out private offices and secretaries on the strength of a practical joke that I personally consider far from funny. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, It'll be kind of hard to face that gang tomorrow from back of the old desk. It would be just as hard to face it from in here if you didn't belong here. Uneasy lies the head... He that... does belong in here, Mr. Baxter. Well, what is the joke this time? He belongs in here because he thinks he belongs in here. Because he thinks... Oh, that that's just... all very deep dish and highfalutin, but far from practical. It is practical, Mr. Baxter. It's the most practical idea you ever had. He belongs in here because he thinks he has ideas... He belongs in here until he proves himself or fails, and then somebody else belongs in here until he proves himself or fails, and then somebody else after him, and so on and so on for always. Oh, I... I don't know how to put it into words like Jimmy could, but all he wants, all any of them wants, is a chance. A chance to show, to... 
to find out what they've got while they're still young and burning, like a like a shortcut or a stepping stone. Oh, I, I, I know they're not going to succeed, at least most of them aren't. They'll all be like Mr. Waterbury soon enough, but most of them anyway, but, but they won't mind it. They, they'll find something else, and they'll be happy because they had their chance. Because it's, it's one thing to muff a chance when you get it, but, but it's another thing never to have had a chance. Oh, please, Mr. Baxter, his, his name's already on the door. Well, if He's anything so... decided me, that would be it. Oh, Mr. Baxter. Now, you've talked enough. Desks have already been moved and the name has been painted on, as you so skillfully point out. So we'll try it for a very short time. And at no advance in salary, you understand? Mm, yes, sir. And for a very short time. Yes, sir. After all, this is a business institution and not a, a cultural or governmental project. Oh, you'll never be sorry, Mr. Baxter. Yes, well, I'm a little bit sorry already, so just let it go at that. Good night. Try to be on time in the morning. Oh, Shaw. Sure. Jimmy, Jimmy. You were wonderful. You'll always be wonderful. I'm just a little bit leery about me. Oh, don't talk like that, Jimmy. This is the chance of a lifetime, darling, and you know you've got what it takes. You know it. I don't know. I never did know it. I got that telegram, and I don't know anymore. I'm like Mr. Baxter. That's why I understood him and didn't say anything. See? Well, even if it shouldn't work out, it's, it's brought us together, darling, and that's something. Listen, I've still got the ring to prove it, and you can't back out of me now, or I, I'd sue you. <laughs> We've plenty to be thankful for, Jimmy. Oh, you poor kid. Yeah. Well, let's let's go. Oh. Hmm. There's a cat again. Oh, maybe he brought us luck, Jimmy. Maybe. Good night, Sam. Good night, sir. Good night. <laughs> oh. What's so funny? I was just thinking how ridiculous Dr. Maxford looked this afternoon arguing with Mr. Schindel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that poor old buzzard. <laughs> Doctor of all the colossal gall. What do you mean by coming to my home and waking me up? I got some good news for you. It took a little doing, but I finally won those clocks over. What a jewelry. Well, it just doesn't matter anymore. This has been the stupidest, the most asinine, the most infuriating. But wait till you hear the winning slogan. But I don't wish to hear the slogan. I don't wish to hear any w another word about the whole mess. Pick your winner, send him a check, and tell him to go soak his head. Listen to this. Is this good? If you don't sleep at night, it isn't the coffee, it's the bunk. <laughs> oh, Bill Docker. It's what you call a pun, and believe me, some pun. We just sent the winner a telegram, a guy by the name of James McDonald, and... Why, Dr. Maxford, how pale you look. <laughs> In just a moment, our stars will return for a curtain call. These days, all our thoughts are on the job our fighting men are doing. It's up to us to back them in every detail. They'll need more and more supplies, ammunition, synthetic rubber tires, yes, and drugs for the wounded. Your used kitchen fats help to make all these things. So keep filling up that can on the back of your stove. You know, ever since D-Day, I've tried to double the amount of fat I've been saving. The way I see it, our boys are doing an all-out job in Europe. And we've got to do an all-out job here at home, too. All the little jobs that add up to so much, like saving every last drop of used fat. Now that we can have meat more often, it should be easy to turn in twice as much as we used to. And even though meats aren't rationed, those two red ration points tokens you get for every pound of waste fats still come in handy for steaks, certain kinds of cheese and butter. You know, Mr. Kennedy, there's one thing I don't understand about that. What's that? Why is it that they give us points for used fats when we don't have to pay any for new ones like shortening and lard? The government doesn't want to uh, use good cooking fats for industrial uses unless it's necessary to do so. <laughs> well, I should hope not. So they're asking women to turn in old burned used fats for our war plants. Keep right on saving every drop of used kitchen fat. Keep a tin can right by the stove. Then take it to your butcher when it's full and collect two points and four cents for every pound. It will be on its way to a war plant in three weeks. Keep on saving used fats. Now, here's Mr. Barrymore with our stars. Now, in any theater I've ever seen, this is the time for a curtain call. 
And nobody's ever earned one more than Dick Powell and Linda Darnell. Thank you, Lionel. It was swell working with you. Dick, you better call me LB. LB? Yep. It's a rule here, you oh. know. <laughs> <laughs> the producer has to be called by his initials. <laughs> well, I, I guess when you first came to Hollywood, Mr. Barrymore, things were a little different than they are now. Yeah. Uh, when I got off the train, Linda, there were hundreds of Indians all over the place. Oh, then you were here before Mr. DeMille, huh? No, the Indians were working in one of DeMille's pictures. <laughs> I was a youngster of 35 or so. Oh, uh, how old were you when you started in pictures, Linda? Oh, 15. Lionel uh, probably started on the stage about the same age, huh? No, no, Dick. No, you see, everybody in my family wears the same costume for their first appearance on the stage. Uh oh, rompers? No, diapers. Uh oh. <laughs> I'd go to see you in diapers myself. <laughs> Incidentally, uh. Did Mr. DeMille leave word about next week's play? He'll be back himself, Dick. And the play will be It Happened Tomorrow. And the stars will be Don Amici and Ann Baxter. And if you have ever dreamed of all the money you could make and of all the wonderful things you could do if you only knew exactly what was going to happen tomorrow, this is the story. It's the strange drama of a man and a girl and tomorrow's newspaper. Uh, we'll all be listening, Lyle. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Uh, our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Don Amici and Ann Baxter in It Happened Tomorrow. This is Lionel Barrymore saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Dick Powell's next picture is the RKO production, Farewell, My Lovely. Linda Darnell appears through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studio, whose latest release is Daryl F. Zanuck's Technicolor production, Wilson. Raymond Walburn will soon be seen in Preston Sturgis' latest picture, Hail the Conquering Hero. Christmas in July was presented through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, producers of I Love a Soldier. Heard in tonight's play were Charles Seal, Leo Cleary, Howard McNear, Verna Felton, Griff Barnett, Eddie Emerson, Tyler McVeigh, Norman Field, Charlie Lung, Franklin Parker, B. Benaderet, Eddie Marr, Abe Reynolds, Norman Nilsson, Norman Wilner, Ken Christie, and Horace Willard.